Well, let's start, Salim, by asking you what have been the big talking points so far uh, at these negotiations? Well, the two big talking points have been the fate of the Kyoto Protocol after 2012. Uh, we still don't know what's going to happen with that. Uh, the Africans are very keen that uh, Durban is not the burial ground of Kyoto, as people are saying. And then the second big one is the Green Climate Fund, uh, the big fund of $100 billion a year, how that's going to run and set up. Those two are the big issues. There are several minor issues on adaptation, on RED, on technology transfer. Uh, all three minor issues are in fairly good shape. We should get a decision here. But the big ones are still up in the air. And regarding the Green Climate Fund, we, we had a report back yesterday from the Transitional Committee. Has that pushed things forward anywhere? Have things changed over the last few days? Well, it remains to be seen how it uh, transpires. What we have is a situation where the Transitional Committee actually came up with a, a reasonably good compromise document. Uh, but at the last minute, at the last meeting of the Transitional Committee, two countries, the United States and Saudi Arabia, uh, objected to the document itself, whereas everybody else had agreed to it. The South African presidency and, and also the chair of the Transitional Committee wants the entire document to be uh, placed on the COP and, and accepted here and hopefully getting the US and Saudi Arabia to withdraw their objections. Um, whether or not they're going to be able to do that is still unclear because some countries want to reopen the document and have uh, bits and pieces that they want to change and if one country does that and other countries want to do that and then we're back to square one again. So the South Africans are pushing very hard to have the entire document accepted as it is, as a compromise text, uh, accepting that not everybody's uh, happy with it, but they can live with it. And we'll see whether or not they'll be able to pull that off. And regarding the Kyoto Protocol, which is, you said was another big issue here, when are we going to see some movement? We've been told to expect fireworks at some stage this week. When's that going to happen? Uh, it's not sure when it will happen. The South Africans, again, are trying very hard to bridge what seems like an unbridgeable gap between the Kyoto parties, the Annex B Kyoto parties, and the rest of the other countries, particularly the large developing countries like China, India, Brazil, and the United States as well. It's very, very difficult uh, to think of what the compromise formula might be, uh, but they're trying to find a formula that everybody can live with, which enables the Kyoto parties to commit to a second commitment period in exchange for the non-Kyoto parties agreeing to come on board to a legally binding instrument at some point in time. There's a lot of debate about what that point in time is, whether it should be five years or 2020. Uh, 2020 seems a long way away. Some countries are pushing for that. We shall see. There is a compromise formula being discussed, uh, but exactly whether or not we'll get that uh, remains to be seen. And. I watched an interview yesterday with uh, Christiana Figueres, and, uh, the, the, kind of the head of the, the climate secretariat here, and she was saying that this is a revolution. This is the biggest revolution that's, that's ever taken place amongst humanity. Is that a, a kind of? Do you agree with with that description of these talks? And do you see that in the process here? Do you see a revolution happening? Well, I think it's the biggest problem facing mankind as a whole, as a planetary problem requiring a global consensus and global actions. I think a large part of the world recognizes that and is willing to do things, but unfortunately some of the leaders of the world, and, and particularly some of the key countries, don't recognize that, or at least if they recognize it, aren't prepared to take the requisite action. Um, a lot of that is because most of the leaders of both developed and developing countries tend to be short-term in their thinking and pulled by domestic political factors more than thinking about what's good for the planet in the long term. So weighing long term versus short term interests, weighing international and global responsibilities versus domestic responsibilities tends to favor domestic and short term over global and international. Of course, if this is a revolution, it's been happening for 20 years now, these talks have been going on. We've got Rio plus 20 coming up. In your uh, experience, I know you've attended almost all of these talks. How have they changed over the years? They've changed significantly in several respects. Firstly, in terms of attendance. We used to get just a few thousand people to these events. Now we get tens of thousands, so certainly over 10,000 coming to them. Only a few thousand of those are negotiators. The rest are non-negotiators. And in a sense, if you want to look at the positive energy in Durban, it's coming from outside the negotiations. There's people doing all kinds of things from the local to the global, uh, at national level, at local level, on mitigation, on adaptation in rich countries and poor countries. And they're all here, they're having side events, they have stalls, booths, uh, events outside the city. People are talking to each other, 
these people are solution oriented, they're not problem oriented. The people in the negotiations are problem oriented and they can't figure out what to do about the problem. I heard you say earlier that uh, every uh, COP, and of course COP is the shorthand for these UN negotiations, every COP is good COP, bad COP. What would you say is going to be the good COP and the bad COP out of these talks here? Well, the, the good COP, in my view, is what happens outside the negotiations, and the bad COP is usually what happens inside the negotiations, <laughs> and, and the negotiators uh, taking inordinate lengths of time to get to some kind of compromise formula, which we then, uh, because it's a, a negotiated settlement that everybody has to agree to, is always a watered-down version of what needs to be done, and nowhere near the level of ambition required by the, the scale of the problem. Whereas the good COP is, as I said, people who are more solution oriented. They're, they're not waiting for a global agreement to do what they think is the right thing to do. And the good news is that there are many, many more people doing that. They're not yet well organized in terms of a global uh, uh, consensus and they certainly haven't been able to sway their own political leaders yet to do the right thing. People tend to be very hesitant about making predictions at these talks, but I'm sure we'll talk to you later next week. And, and what do you think you'll be saying to me? What, what will be coming out of this, this conference in, two, in a week and a half's time? Well, I always remain optimistic and hopeful. Um, I'm a natural uh, optimist. So I hope that the South Africans, and I have a lot of respect for the South Africans, uh, they have a great responsibility as chair. They have a history of bridging great political divides when they ended apartheid, which was, you know, a huge uh, political issue with extremes of political positions. So they know how to bring different groups together and find common ground in a consultative manner. So I have great faith that they'll be able to do that here and we will have a compromise formula. A compromise formula means that not everybody is going to be happy with it, uh, which is inevitable, but at least it will keep the show on the road. We'll have the Kyoto Protocol in the second commitment period because I feel it would be disastrous if we really do have the end of the Kyoto Protocol in Durban. Then we would certainly have to say these talks are not worth pursuing anymore. We'll, we'll keep our eye on that and talk to you later next week. Thank you, Salim.